can change the world. Here's this next guest as the reason that there is a better world. Susan Davis from BRAC USA. Hello, Susan. Hi, Stan. Nice to see you again. And it, it is true that the, the world is a better place because of you, uh, in large part because of all of the things that you do at BRAC. For those people who don't know about BRAC, can you say just a little bit about what it does? Sure. BRAC's an amazing international development organization that's homegrown from Bangladesh, started by Bangladeshis right after their war of liberation. It grew up uh, trying to solve the problems in that country and helping people help themselves, and now is the largest development organization in the world, what? working in uh, 10 other countries in Asia and Africa besides Bangladesh, with over 100,000 employees, touching the lives of over 135 million people. It's got a budget of in Bangladesh alone of $600 million then 70% is self-generated. So it mm. combines the best of business thinking and, and markets um, with great grassroots development um, and unleashing the potential of women and their families. So it is geared towards women? It's geared to change, and women are catalysts for change. But BRAC works with everybody from little kids all the way up to the, your grandparents. Mm. Uh, so it's uh, inclusive. Um, but it's recognized the importance of women as um, catalytic change agents in mm -hmm. communities. Uh, we're going to talk about just several of your programs because there's not enough time in the next 24 hours to talk about all of your programs. One of them is about, um, well, let's say from Uganda, the effective, helping youth become more effective in that program. What is that? We have a very exciting uh, experiment that's gone on in Uganda. The question was, would everything that BRAC learned in Bangladesh, would it work somewhere else? And could we do it maybe quicker and faster um, and smarter? And so with the support of the MasterCard Foundation, Nike Foundation, other partners, now in just six years, BRAC Uganda has become the largest organization that touches mm -hmm. over three, three and a half million Ugandans' lives. as 10 percent of the country. And we've opened, and opened up just a huge amount of opportunity for young people. First, we hired them. So we have over 2,200 staff working in Uganda. Hmm. And we've set up clubs for teenagers. And we've got over 60,000 of them um, coming to these clubs regularly, getting training in life skills and financial literacy and how to earn some money and save. And they even borrow um, microloans to start their own business. These, um, these girls also are becoming our staff. So right now, I think it's 30% of the, the staff in that program have come from being club members themselves. Mm. So it's a way that um, the people who you're trying to help are actually involved in helping themselves and giving back to others. Well, and imagine that, helping yourself. <laughs> it's how we do it, right? Yeah. And so one of the things that we learned from talking with young people is how important education is. Education and jobs, it's on their mind, right? So there's a huge cliff um, when uh, kids try to transition from primary to secondary school. So what we decided to do with the support of the MasterCard Foundation is start a scholarship program that's going to help now 5,000 5,000 of the best and the brightest Ugandan kids be able to continue on from primary to secondary school. Um, young boys and girls, we've got the first 600 in O-levels and A-levels right now. And what we're also doing is creating on-ramps with different partnerships so that they'll be able to get scholarships to go on to university. Not mm. just in, in Uganda, but also uh, around the continent, yeah, in this country, um, other countries, maybe even BRAC University in Bangladesh. Yeah. You know, tell us some, some more of these success stories. I mean, people out there who, who give, they want to know that they are they're donating to something that works, right? So mm. some of the, I, I know that BRAC has hundreds and hundreds of stories, and you do too. What's, let, what's like a good success story? Hmm. Well, yesterday I was meeting with a young woman, um, uh, Olivia, who's part of the youth think tank. And she and three colleagues from other countries came to our office. Um, we have a little office here in Manhattan with a dozen staff. And she started as one of these club members. She had, came from a big family. Uh, she didn't think she was going to have a chance to be able to continue with her schooling. She 
met BRAC. Uh, she was able to start earning, finish her education, and she got picked to do what? Be part of a, vid a uh, participatory video team. So now, mm -hmm. just like Rainmakers, uh, we've got a team of young girls who are making videos that help to bring the voices of youth to the policymakers or right into the, the rooms of supporters uh, through our website. Oh, that's so fantastic. It's, it's absolutely terrific um, that they take the camera and take control of the agenda and they find out um, the solutions uh, to their own problems. That's the empowerment process mm -hmm. that I see happening over and over. So it sounds like the BRAC way, helping people help themselves. Yeah, that's the um, only way, I think. Now, got to be fair, we've talked about successes. I suspect you probably know about successes yet to be. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things don't work. BRAC was selected as the number one NGO by Geneva Global and the number one microfinance organization by Philanthropedia. So we, we keep getting recognized, um, but in the midst of that, we ourselves are our harshest critic. And we realize that commercial microfinance uh, was not going to work well in South Sudan and Afghanistan. Mm. It had been working okay, but when I say commercial microfinance, that means that somebody on the other end has lent us money and they want to get repaid in dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Not grant money. So what we did is uh, quickly replace the commercial money in South Sudan with, with uh, our own grant money that we'd raised and tried to make it work, but the conditions in that new country um, just weren't right for us to be able to maintain a self-sustaining institution. So we recognized that in South Sudan and Afghanistan, we had to close the commercial microfinance mm -hmm. window. But at the same time, we decided to triple the investment that we're making in development assistance for improving people's livelihoods, uh, for education, and for health care. So basically, the BRAC way uh, is not to run when things get tough, not to abandon the families in those communities that we know need us. Um, but to figure out another way. And if the, the business environment is not yet ripe, then let's use development assistance and keep trying to deliver the services that people need to help themselves. I hope it's okay if we talk about microfinance just a little bit. Sure. I have been a big proponent of microfinance, but recently I was in West Africa, and what I saw was such an influx of microfinance loans that there, it, it seemed like that there were too many. And if there was that many of them, I know from a business standpoint that that means that there's somebody's making money off of it, not necessarily the people who are intended. And so the interest rates should come down, and they're not. Hmm. Has microfinance reached its peak, or is there another way? That hmm. I don't think microfinance has reached its peak. I think microfinance in different markets goes through course corrections. Hmm. When there's um, a hot market, overlending, uh, when there's not enough competition between providers, when there's not enough focus on mission, um, mission to really help people who are poor and reach the poorest come out of poverty, uh, when there's insufficient uh, regulation, uh, when there's inadequate um, use of technology to create efficiencies or inadequate um, training and capacity to build. You know, we operate in two countries in West Africa, in Sierra Leone and Liberia. And we're the lowest cost provider in both of those markets. Both of them, though, are going through very tough times. Uh, I kid you mm -hmm. not. It's not, uh, it's not easy um, or a boom business market, um, unlike some of the other places uh, in West Africa. You've got um, already two microfinance providers in Liberia that have gone under, one last year and, and one this year. Um, we've been dealing with rising um, portfolio at risk problems. So that means basically getting people to repay their loans on time. Mm. The rainy season is very hard on businesses. Mm. And if your um, overall economic climate is not good and you're competing for too few customers, it's very hard to repay your loans if you're not making enough. So that's the basic problem. Um, what I think, though, is um, you know, the critique of microfinance is healthy um, because it has matured as an industry. And the importance of the, the advocates who are part of a movement using microfinance as a tool to defeat poverty is even more important. And that's where one of the things, uh, Stan, that we've been working on is a new campaign to try to 
really lift up and showcase the work that we've done uh, with the ultra poor. Mm -hmm. Because right now, one million of the five million customers that we serve in our microfinance program in Bangladesh mm -hmm. came from the ultra poor. So it is working. Yes, it can work. This idea is so powerful. And it came about when, um, more than a dozen years ago, we started critiquing ourselves, saying microfinance is not reaching the poorest. Um, groups self-select, the poorest don't come forward, uh, they're risk averse, We're, our staff are risk averse and, and don't want to bet on people who are really poor. So we created a special program to target uh, these women and their families to provide a consumption stipend for probably about six months so that they stabilize their their own caloric intake and, and don't sell whatever asset we give. Uh, we, we actually transfer an asset to them so that we don't make them borrow, you know, mm -hmm. for uh, buying a cow or goats or setting up a little mm -hmm. business where they're, they're going to sell fruits so the, or vegetables. So the asset isn't necessarily just cash? No, no. Um, we actually, well, we will help them learn um, skills so that they can start earning. We'll make sure that they get a savings account. We also pay attention to their family needs, um, stabilize their health um, situation for themselves and their kids. If they've got school-aged children, get them into school. And every week, have somebody who comes by to visit them at home. In our, mm -hmm. in our terms, that would be like a coach, right? Yeah. Or a social worker. But it's somebody on their side that helps them go from a place of deep depression where they don't imagine a future to a place where they start seeing the way out, they see the pathway, they start imagining the future, and they start getting people on their side. In fact, we'll even organize a little committee with the uh, headmaster from the local school and some of the, you know, the middle class folks there who, who care and want to give back to look out for them because if somebody steals their goat or she gets beaten up or, you know, problems that happen um, with injustice, you've got somebody on your side. So to get out of the quagmire of poverty, the, the real sticky floor, you've got to create a springboard. Those people can graduate onto the bottom rung and then start using microfinance successfully or be employed in a job in somebody's home or in the garment factories. But You've got to have a special targeted intervention in order to really change their lives. And that, that graduation program for the ultra poor, uh, the World Bank's consultative group to assist the poorest mm -hmm. with Ford Foundation started systematically testing in 2006. And in eight countries with uh, more than a dozen groups, they've all tried it and it worked. Over 90% of these people are able to graduate and stay out of poverty. Five years later, our randomized control trial survey shows that they've stayed out of extreme poverty. Well, let's ask the next question, uh, because as, as you said, mostly women, do their children stay out of the cycle of poverty too? Do they get to go to school? Well, we don't have the evidence on, on the million four uh, families that, that we've done in Bangladesh on that. We've got evidence now six years after um, they've participated in the program. Um, with very good researchers from this country doing mm. it. But what we have is um, the indications from our 10 million primary school graduates and pre-primary graduates in Bangladesh. Some of them have gone all the way. Because, you know, we have a university in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. We started, we have 5,000 students, undergrad and graduate students. And we've managed to give scholarships to about 10 percent of those. would love to increase it to half or more. And those children who got a chance to go to one of these second chance schools who are now studying to be doctors and lawyers who have graduated um, first ever, not just in their family but in their village, mm -hmm. they are changing the, the face of poverty. They're going to they're gonna be able to really make that generational shift. And uh, I find that's the place of, of real excitement and encouragement. In fact, I think the, the future 100,000 staff of BRAC are going to come from the children of those women who scrimped and saved and, and, and made sure that they got a better life. <clears throat> so again, BRAC helping people, helping themselves. Mm. Wow, amazing. Um, BRAC and Novo Foundation, new partnership. What's that all about? Well, actually, it's an old partnership because the Novo Foundation is the 
um, the folks who put their uh, hand out to help me when I was starting BRAC USA seven years ago. Mm. They, uh, Jennifer and Peter Buffett, gave me um, their old office when they moved two doors down. Um, their desks, their chairs, even their plants, and I'm happy to report the plants are still alive. <laughs> um, they also decided uh, maybe they should give me a little cash um, and called up their, their friends over at the Gates Foundation and said, you want a partner? So my first startup support came from the Novo Foundation with, Bill and, start. with Bill and Melinda uh, Gates. And then they said, well, <clears throat> you know, we don't want to create dependency, so let's see if you can survive without us. So seven years later, um, they're circling back, and they're, they're pretty proud of the, the little organization that they helped to uh, blow wind under our wings with. And, and so we just um, agreed on a $5 million uh, new grant to support uh, to support girls, adolescent girls, the most marginalized and excluded mm. and vulnerable girls in some of the toughest places, mm. starting in Afghanistan, oh. for girls to be able to go to school and try to avoid getting married off as, you know, 10, 11, 12 year old kids, um, supporting girls in South Sudan, where, you know, child marriage is huge, yeah. um, literacy is not even double digits for girls yet. Um, and they need a chance to be able to learn and earn and save and, and hopefully hold off having babies. Uh, and we're also um, getting support in Sierra Leone and Tanzania for their, uh, with their grant program. Mm. I've, in my recent travels in, in West Africa and, in, and actually in other parts of the world, I have seen some, some things that people do that look to me like there's probably the same thing that they did 500 years ago in terms of the way that they fish or the way that they farm. Mm. I'm not saying that it's bad, but there are so many advantages that people have today. How do you change 500 years, a thousand years of culture where women are not second place, but oftentimes not there at all? Mm. Well, Abed, the founder of BRAC, often says that we're in the business of culture change. Culture is man-made, it's woman-made, and uh, it doesn't um, need to remain static. So every day we create a new cultures. Um, the traditions that are really harmful um, and that hold women back, um, that stunt the lives of girls in far too many places, we're trying to change those practices. And it is possible to change people's behavior. And in fact, there's a whole field of behavioral economics that, you know, studies positive deviance. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe 95% of people are doing it this way, but it's really interesting to figure out how did those 5% change? And that's part of what we've been doing, is figuring out how to back the change agents in communities. The other thing that's uh, possible is bring in new technology. You know, new technology is a disruptor. Uh, new opportunity creates disruption, and from that, cultures shift. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do in Bangladesh right now um, through these girls' clubs is they have singing and dancing competitions. And because it's the modern world and, and we don't have to just stick to the, the village showcase, we actually have a cable television program where we bring the finalists, and it's kind of like, in our terms, American Idol. Mm. But they're all poor girls. And it's the first time that they get to be on a stage, and they sing and they dance. Now, the girls in Uganda heard this, and they've got their own singing, dancing, and drumming competition, and they're, <laughs> they're wanting their own TV show, too. Okay. Um, you know, we started a company um, in Bangladesh, a mobile payments company. It's mm -hmm. a joint venture. We, we did that uh, almost 18 months, two years ago. Mm -hmm. Subsidiary of the commercial bank, BRAC Bank in Bangladesh, that's a small business lender. And Bcash the name of this company, is, has been um, really changing the way people understand um, possibilities. So very fast we've now gotten 7 million customers, it's 80% market share, and people are sending money through Bcash, it's now a verb, they're Bcashing money, <laughs> um, from garment girls who are working in the industry to their families back in rural areas. You know, you're looking at new ways to pay for school, um, to be able to access health care. So 
the rules about where women can go and women's mobility and what women can do and staying inside of a, you know, a, a bari, a, a compound, all of that's being shattered because of economic pressures and economic opportunities and because of the leadership of amazing, amazing women and girls. You know, it's making me remember of this incredible girl, Sharifa, who uh, was one of our first students in the driving school that mm -hmm. we started in Bangladesh. I don't know if you heard about that, Stan, but uh, driving is a very gendered occupation in, in uh, Bangladesh and kind of like in Saudi Arabia, m women usually don't drive. They're, not, they're allowed to, but they just don't learn. Mm -hmm. So we started a driving school thinking there's enough testosterone on the road and maybe it would help, plus again try to have, have uh, girls do non-traditional occupations. And this girl was just dying to get away from her mother-in-law and have an <laughs> opportunity to, uh, to earn money. And she said, um, she said, you know, when I'm behind the wheel, I feel like I'm flying. I feel like I can do anything. And that's the, that's the feeling. That's the feeling of possibility. That's the feeling that comes when you can unleash potential that's there everywhere. Hmm. It's the everywhere. Do you ever fear, and I know that BRAC is a Bangladeshi uh, organization, but do you ever fear that you're looking at things with your American viewpoints and maybe the beneficiaries don't agree? <laughs> well, I know I've got American eyes on, on the, the problems and the world, so I trust the, uh, the 100,000 colleagues to always set me straight. Um, Fortunately, I, I got to live in Bangladesh for four and a half years uh, back in the 80s, and I've been really blessed to be able to travel uh, to everywhere we work and a lot of places. So I've spent a lot of time listening to, uh, to young people, to women, uh, and I take my cues from them. Um, if our programs weren't growing, if people weren't showing up, if there wasn't uh, demand for the services, if they weren't willing to pay, for you know the interests on loans or the seeds that we offer or the safe birth kits or the family planning uh, methods if people didn't have skin in the game um, maybe I'd question it but I think you know there's a market test mm -hmm. and um, you can see evidence there that there's good demand for it and if you get to do what I do, you see the, the sparkle test, you know, the, the light in people's eyes, um, and you know they're, they're happy um, and they're appreciative. The CGI 2013 theme is mobilizing impact. On your blog, there's a mobilizing who. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, I, I uh, was just reflecting on the theme on opening day, and I thought, um, you know, let's not forget about who um, is the primary actor to, to mobilize. Um, the, the people who are the most marginalized and vulnerable and economically excluded are the mobilizers of the change that we want to see. We can accompany them, we can support them with our resources, with different structures that enable them uh, to move forward, but it is the energy of those people directly affected um, that's going to change the, the, the nature of these problems. Just mm -hmm. like the young man we watched uh, on the stage uh, from Kibera, you know, with Chelsea Clinton. I mean, here at CGI, they're actually lifting up people who are change agents, like the woman, the Maasai woman you were mm -hmm. just telling me about, mm -hmm. who I, I listened to. Um, by bringing more and more people who are directly affected by the problems themselves into these rooms here in New York, I think we're trying to bridge the gap. And that's, and that's been my role. You know, I, I know the poorest people on the planet and the richest. And I know that they, they want to be connected. Mm -hmm. So intermediaries mm -hmm. that are effective or efficient can scale, can truly listen to the grassroots like BRAC, that's what we need to invest in. And mm -hmm. so we're mobilizing in partnership uh, with governments and private sector and other civil society groups and researchers and universities and ordinary folks. Hmm. I usually end interviews by asking a question about looking five years down the road. 
But with you, I, I just have to tell you, every time that I, that I get to sit down with you, I, I come away from the interview being so inspired, I'm ready to go out and tackle the world. <laughs> what keeps you, Susan Davis, driving this way? Love. Uh, I, I think uh, I had the good fortune when I was quite young to have my heart uh, opened and touched by um, these extraordinary people. I was allowed into a woman's world that I never knew existed. And uh, I'll never get the voices out of my head, so I try to do everything I can in my power um, uh, to be in service. Susan Davis from Bragg. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time.